Welcome back to Radio Rothbard. I'm Ryan McMagan. I'm a senior editor with the Mises Institute. And here with me this week is Tho Bishop, my associate editor. And we're going to talk a bit this week about elections, voting, uh, voter fraud, those sorts of things. And, but not from the usual perspective, right? Well, of course, we, we don't uh, necessarily assume uh, the mainstream view that there's something sacrosanct about these sort of things. But nevertheless, it's, it's obviously important to the outcome of elections. And why should we care? Is there some sort of principle that leads us to think, yep, we should be committed to election integrity Um, Do we consider elections to be important? Some of these issues we'll cover today, of course, because our ideological pinning, of course, is that of liberalism, laissez-faire liberalism from the 18th and 19th centuries, those free market guys, those those radical anti-government people uh, who pioneered what I guess we today call libertarianism, but really is just the modern form of classical liberalism. So how is it that elections somehow became tied up with that ideology? And does that mean we have to care deeply about election integrity today? Uh, so we'll look into that a bit. And though, just just kind of like really establish the relevance of this. You know, I've been seeing some stuff in the paper. I don't really follow campaigns and elections very closely, right? But I've seen stuff about uh, Steve Bannon and uh, the whole issue of keeping really close tabs on precincts and uh, making sure that ballots as they come in are tracked more completely and so on. So, so really, what's the context of this? Uh, just if for people who haven't really been keeping up really closely with it, well, what is the state of the debate over election integrity right now? Well, one of the things that's I think really brought this conversation back uh, in the last few weeks has been uh, Dinesh D'Souza's documentary, 2000 Mules, um, which kind of focuses narrowly on the question of kind of these, these bulk election uh, drop boxes. And the role that uh, a you know a, a left-aligned um, nonprofits kind of collected bulk ballots mailed out because of the emergency situation dubbed from COVID, um, and that you had these mules that they as, as they call them. Uh, depositing multiple ballots within these drop boxes at various odd times of the night, uh, and, and that this is a larger critique of, again, the particular situation of the 2020 election that still a large percentage of the population, including most Republicans, see as illegitimate, um, which I think is, is interesting just from a larger dynamic of the the perception of legitimacy of these sort of governing institutions, right? And, and I think that creates some very interesting dynamics in the larger political conversation. Um, but what we've seen is that while some of the, the other concerns, you know, you had like Sidney Powell and Rudy Giuliani, uh, kind of in the immediate aftermath of the 2020 election, um, making claims about uh, voting machines and sort of like technical changes, Ill- illegitimate sort of votes, illegitimate tabulations. You know, this was kind of specifically on some of the procedures of handling ballots and the response legislatively has been various states, usually those controlled by Republicans, reining in the use of these drop boxes, changing some of the procedures for collecting votes, um, reining in the, the kind of the bulk mail voting dynamic where everyone's kind of sent a ballot if they're a registered voter, um, which is separate from those similar to absentee voting where you request a ballot and vote by mail, right? So you, you, you've seen this kind of be one of those pet issues of Republicans kind of tightening the process by which ballots are collected um, and, and counted for, you know, the future elections. And then, of course, you know, the, these these sort of changes have been uh, uh, condemned as, you know, Jim Crow style voter suppression, poll tax sort of stuff by all the usual suspects on the left. It led the, you know, the. the Major League Baseball boycotted Atlanta 
uh, because they they made some, some moderate changes to voter laws last year. It, it, it has it has dovetailed into this this larger cultural issue, where if you believe there's any changes at all that needs to be elected uh, to to, the, to these elections, you you are you are you know grouped into whatever the, the proper term for the far left is of the day by the press, right? And so it's it's just interesting how you know really what 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 is just election procedure, um, and and ha- has really become I think one of the the, the very one of those very heated topics um, separating the, the left and right sort of tribes in political America today. Well, and of course, it's easy to see um, why one group would want to ensure that those people who vote are people who are likely to provide an advantage to uh, whoever one's coalition is, right? So it seems the belief is, and... There is not, it's not overwhelming evidence that high turnout favors the left. Um, I know they often assume that and claim that. Research has come down on both sides. Probably the preponderance, though, is on the side that higher turnout uh, tends to favor uh, the left. And maybe then the assumption is, is that just more ballots then favor the left, right? So we just dump a bunch of ballots then at a place and we don't know where they came from and maybe a bunch of dead people voted, uh, then that must favor the left. At least that's what you're going to hear, I suppose, from the right all the time, because every time there's a dispute over voting, of course, each side thinks that they're the honest side and the other side is using dirty tricks, right? So from the left's perspective, the right uses dirty tricks by their, ex, their right, they're expunging people from the voter rolls, and uh, that is somehow dishonest in their view. And then the right just assumes that what, wherever these ballots are coming from, that may not be where there may not be a good paper trail. We just assume it's all for Biden, and and they'll regale you with endless evidence about how that's the case and so on. And maybe it is. Uh, but the question then is beyond just, oh, do I favor this sort of uh, ballot tracking or these sort of voter registration requirements uh, because it adv- advantages my side? The question is, is voting good? Do I want to maximize it? Do Is fewer voters better? Uh, and that has totally changed over, si- over time from the perspective of the free market people. So when you look at the origins of what today we would side with as the good guys, right, the free market, uh, anti-centralization, uh, anti-autocratic, uh, big government people, they often sided, the people who were the, the laissez-faire, they often sided with more voting. And why was that? Well, in the 18th century and even really farther back, the government was firmly controlled by basically absolutist monarchs in many cases, or if they didn't rise to the level of monarchs, just more local princes. Uh, The Prussian state, for example, uh, not exactly known for its laissez-faire views of business, right? And this proceeded in the 19th century. Bismarck hated the laissez-faire crowd. He, he, re- <laughs> he referred to people like Richard Cobden in England as uh, money bags, Manchesterites, right? You know, there's these greedy capitalists who want to come in here and ruin our, our far more wonderful German culture, which has no time for all that money making. We're more concerned with honor and uh, with the fatherland and all that. That sort of stuff. And so a lot of time, these older monarchist types hated the liberals and denounced them as unpatriotic because they wanted to make money instead of defend the honor of the king or whatever. And so, of course, then the liberals often saw, well, uh, the real interests are with the people who don't want to pay high taxes on bread, which are only there to support the nobility and the uh, East India Company and these big corporations that are connected to the monarch that are exploiting the regular people. They're costing, uh, they're causing the the cost of living to go up for regular people. Taxes are high. Taxes are there to benefit the ruling class, which is the monarch's friends. So let's give the vote to more regular people. And so at that time, then, the the drive was among the Whigs and the liberals to expand the vote, believing that this would lead to more laissez-faire thinking. And it did, apparently, in the mid-19th century. It was as the vote was expanded, and at least in England, as 
as the reform movements went in in the 1830s and 1840s, this undermined the power of the regime and the state and taxes did go down. And there was uh, more successful opposition to the imperialist state and so on. But then at some point in the late 19th century, then we, we began to, to associate expanding vote with the left and with the commies. And so it, it seems to kind of really depend what is your principle, what is your view of voting, depends on what maybe the ideological ebbs and flows are, uh, what, what is the ideology of the common people, if the ideology of the common people, as it was in the mid-19th century, was one toward free markets and, and toward lower taxes, then sure, you'd want more voting, right? But it seems that now, perhaps due to public schools, uh, the university system and so on, uh, the, the the working classes, I don't know, the lower middle classes, the the, the belief is that these people all uh, are against free markets and want more government intervention everywhere. I'm not really sure that's true. The, the most commie people I know are people with graduate degrees. Right. So certainly a lot of the most free market people are like plumbers uh, and people you meet at your parish who are like mailmen, and, and and often government employees. They're actually more skeptical of the state than someone who works at Twitter and has a PhD or something. And so I'm not sure that's really it, but, it, but there doesn't seem to be like a real, well, if you're a classical liberal, liberal if you're in favor of laissez-faire, you have to be for or against elections. That, that seems to just depend on historical context. Well, and I think the last election in particular kind of highlighted this, this very interesting uh, uh conflict between the, you know, the, 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 the assumption that high election turnout is somehow a, a, an inherently left-wing phenomenon. Because even though Trump lost the presidential race, uh, you had Republicans overperform congressional races, um, exceeded a lot of expectations at state races. And so it's the, the down ballot side of things. Um, Republicans won a, a few Senate seats that, that some people didn't think they were going to get. Um, you have that dynamic where Biden won the presidency, but Republicans underperformed down ballot with an environment of very, very high voter turnout broadly. But I, I think this kind of goes to a very interesting dynamic here where it goes to the dangers of kind of homogenizing um, American political trends as a whole. Not only is there great differences between regions and states and things like that, but but the dynamic between like rural and urban voters. It's like one of the things that the Dinesh D'Souza movie um, kind of kind of emphasized is sort of of modern day sort of political machines that, you know, you had this ecosystem of, you know, you know, Mark Zuckerberg funded or, you know, George Soros types, you know, this NGO money designed within the cities, you know, Atlanta and Fulton County, Georgia, you know, Phoenix, Arizona, Minneapolis, that their their mission of these nonprofits under the, the cover of, you know, securing democracy in the emergency situation of COVID, uh, they wanted to amplify certain demographics within the city. And that is where kind of the bulk collection of ballots became a big part of that because you know, it's, it's the, they were paying these people to, to collect these ballots in bulk, which I, I think even most of the, the election law, right, you were supposed to only collect, you know, you can only deliver it for family members and things like that. And, and that, that was not going on there. Um, whereas high, you, you had at the same time, very, very high turnout in non-urban areas. And I think that is kind of this, this backlash to, you know, it's, it's, it's not the absolute monarch anymore, but it is very much, uh, uh, sort of this, this, you know, I mean, it, it, woke is, the, is a cliche, but this, this very, uh, uh pl politicized cultural machine, right. That, that wants to you know, you know, force you to wear the the LGBTQ ribbon, right? And and to be okay with a man in a dress teaching your kids in preschool. And that, you know, there there's a cultural, I think, resistance to that from non, you know, graduate school uh uh you know alumni that is creating this interesting dynamic where even though perhaps some of the economic issues haven't changed now that we're dealing with you know five, six dollar gas. Uh, you know, e economics might play a, a bigger role than it may have in the 2020 election when everyone's still kind of flush with truck bucks and, and you know, the, 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 that sort of dynamic there. Um, but I, I do think you're seeing kind of a broad mass rejection of the very politicized cultural state of the left. Um, and that is why, you know, there, there, 
the concerns are, I think, particularly about the way that cities are are, are handling elections. And it, it kind of reminds me of of the degree to which, you know, back in the day, you know, the Republican machines of, of New York and, and, you know, some of these bigger cities, the, the way that they relied upon like Irish immigrants as a very key part of the voting bloc because a lot of them worked for the the, the, the big wigs and, and things like that. So that, you know, they were going to make sure that they voted uh, right along the lines of, of the people that they are working for. And I, I think when you see some of the, the dynamics play out, some of the arguments being made in the D'Souza movie, um, you know, it, you know, regardless of whether or not you, you take a face value, the argument would be that, you know, if you, if you think about like the Somali population in Minnesota, many of which are relying upon a similar sort of network of NGOs and things like that, that that has a role as well in sort of maximizing a, a very particular type of turnout um, that is, is very much uh, uh, deliberately aimed at, if not cynically so, a very specific political ends. And that's, that's I think, something, parts of these conversations that, that are definitely missed, um, where you're either, either one side that, you know, all high turnout is voter fraud and dead people voting, um, the other side, there is no problem at all. More voting is necessarily a good thing. Um, I, I think in, in this case, even the D'Souza movie, most of the arguments were not fraudulent ballots. They weren't dead people. It was ter- it, it was the improper handling and bundling of legal ballots from certain people motivated and possibly coerced by some of these uh, kind of machine style political tactics. And so this brings us back then to the issue of why should you care then about who is voting. And there's no clear laissez-faire liberal uh, principle here, right? Obviously, there are issues of fairness and of following the rules, uh, and that's good, but those are just general values that uh, there's no clear connection then to just being a laissez-faire liberal or being free market or anything like that. Uh, and I think we could all agree then that you don't want dead people voting, that you don't want people who already voted once to vote three more times. Uh, but, you, but you could even come to agreement on that and still end up then with a system where uh, you have a bunch of people voting who maybe shouldn't be voting based on some other principle. And I think the principle that the, the old liberals were holding to was you shouldn't have nonproductive people making the decisions about how state resources are used and spent. And uh, that was, I think, the real question there, because early on the idea was the we as the bourgeoisie, the productive people, are producing all the new good stuff with industrialization and innovation, and then the monarchs are just stealing it all and giving it out to their friends. So therefore we want to uh, distribute the power among the productive people, and that's us, the middle class. Uh, but over time, then that clearly became less the guiding light of who should vote, of who should be voting, and it became more a principle of well, whoever's subject to the rules of the state should be, should be voting, or just if you happen to live within a geographical area, should be voting, uh, and that seems to be the dominant idea now. So, the question then is, what do you do? to control those rules um, and to enforce them. And and as you noted, right, you then get these uh, just cultural disputes over uh, who's controlling the election and uh, who's collecting the ballots. And do I want the other side to have access to that sort of political power? And I think we could look then that it's not necessarily tied to either side, right? Because, again, as we often come back to the the Jeffersonians the type, they were very good at that, at uh, getting people to vote and at gaining power through that means. It absolutely has not been proven to be the case uh, historically, just say the 1870s, that new immigrants were going to be voting against free markets, because the Democrats are very good at bringing in new immigrants, and the Democrats were the free market party back then. And they wanted decentralization, and they wanted more local control over markets, and they did not want bankers controlling everything or federal regulation over everything. Um, So a lot of the assumptions today about who should be voting and who should not be voting, uh, from the right wing's point of view, historically haven't really necessarily uh, played out. And so... I guess what you're left with then is, well, 
the minimum we can agree on is a good thing is just that people should follow the rules. Uh, <laughs> and uh, maybe you have to fall back on ideology or something else then uh, to really just deal with the, the other factors there. And of course, the rules in this case, you know, at least in theory, dictated by 50 states, not not, you know, the feds. Right. Um, and I, I do think that there was some interesting arguments about the way those rules were handled uh, in 2020, because you, you had situations where, you know, the, the state constitution says election laws have to go through the legislature. Right. But the governor uses the emergency orders again, using the excuse of covid to, to kind of rewrite things. And, and I, I think that this dynamic, I think, is interesting because, you know, you, you get to this point where, again, if 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 you accept the the argument that democracy legitimizes state power by being a demonstration of self-determination at the ballot box or whatever, you know, that that justification depends upon, you know, a, a, a level of of integrity within that system measuring that that support um, and in much the same way, like I, I, I think it's it's similar to that dy dynamic where if if the justice system presents a legitimate use of state power based off of the way evidence is presented, you know, it, you know, once you break down that kind of chain of custody on what lends itself to being the underlying justification for the exercise of state power, like, you know, you know the lack of, of any sort of custody controls, you know, for, for some of these ballot boxes, I, I think is, is a, a very valid argument, um, even if you're not the biggest Dinesh D'Souza fan. One more interesting, though, is that regardless of the theoretical arguments about political legitimacy, the fact that this issue has become such a heated left versus right aspect of this broadening culture war, I think, demonstrates the breakdown of you know, the the sacrosanct idea of American democracy, right? Because, you know, if, if the idea is that, oh, well, you know, the, 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 the electoral process legitimizes state power uh, because it shows what the public wants, and then you have one side recognizing that, no, I don't care if Joe Biden got 80 million votes. I am not okay with policies X, Y, and Z. And, and it's, I don't only disagree with them, I hate them. And they are hostile to me and my views, then there there is no bending the knee. There is no acceptance of, oh, well, at least he's my president. You know, I, I don't like the man, but I respect the office. What we're seeing is the breakdown of the respect for the office. And and that's where I, I think this dynamic, the and, and, and of course, again, as as it's you know pointing out hypocrisy is, is a loser's game in politics, but you know, the left rejected the legitimacy of the 2016 election based off of the, the Russia collusion arguments, too. And, and I know that you've talked in the past, you've given some great talks about the, 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 the way to which democracy really does, you know, like is, is, you know, just a justification for whatever those in power, you know, want to do anyway. The, the fact that I think normal people are waking up to the idea that it, it doesn't matter how hard they vote the deep state regime is going to march on stepping on their face and, 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 and getting $6 gasoline and, and, de and depriving them of, of, you know, their, the, the life that they have grown accustomed to in, in modern America, simply being able to point to the political process as justification for these things is not going to work. And likewise, I think that, you know, if, if you end up getting, you know, I, I think that you, you're going to see the left argue. I have no doubt that they'll, they'll claim that DeSantis is sort of rigging things in Florida because of just how obviously wrong, uh, uh, you know, his how, how, how horrific, you know, his his uh, education policy is, which is you know detrimental to, to a certain minority group or something like that. Right. Both sides are no longer playing this game that, you know, we can just solve our pro our problems, you know, through figuring out uh, who can persuade most people in election. It is a recognition that these are two just powers at at war, um, and and I think this is something that's not going to go away. It doesn't matter how secure, you know, it doesn't matter what election laws you pass. If Joe Biden wins the twenty twenty four elections, the 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 most strict rules that Republicans put in place is not going to give the Republican voters confidence that he is a legitimate uh, president by any means. Well, maybe that's one reason, too, you want to drive up total vote numbers, no matter where they're coming from, right, is that you have this belief that it somehow legitimizes the regime. 
if a lot of people are voting. And that's one of the greatest coups, I think, uh, that's uh, been employed by pro-regime types and people who believe in large, expansive, interventionist uh, states, is, is that they keep telling people that, yes, well, look at all these people participating in democracy. Isn't that wonderful? Doesn't that show how legitimate our government is? And even a lot of people who... Uh, <laughs> who fancy themselves as anti-regime, they buy into that pro-regime ideology, right? That was, nobody believed that in the 18th century, that voting was a means of showing your support for the regime. The purpose of elections was to provide a veto against the powers of the regime. Elections were a veto process. They weren't a, let's show our support for the regime process. And you can see that even people on our side uh, have completely forgotten that aspect of it. They now completely buy into this idea that voting is necessarily pro-regime uh, is because you'll hear that argument that just voting means you support the regime, which... No, that's a new, completely new idea. I, if, if voter turnout is humongous, I could just as easily argue that voter uh, turnout is humongous because people are so afraid of the regime and hate it. Because lots of people vote based on fear, right? They're not voting their aspirations and their hopes. And boy, has that been proven right a million times, right? I remember... <laughs> Hubert Humphrey, I remember, gave some dumb speech about how you can't vote your fears, you have to vote your hopes. He was hoping to, to defeat Nixon. And guess what? Everybody turned out and voted their fears because they were afraid of street violence, and Nixon ran on a uh, law and order policy. And uh, so he was wrong. People largely vote their fears. So if you have huge turnout, it means people are afraid of the other guy. It means uh, they, uh, they, they fear that the power of the regime is going to be used against them. So I, I don't see how we can assume that high, high voter turnout somehow lends legitimacy to the state, especially when it's a 50-50 vote. And, uh, <laughs> and all that does is demonstrate that people hate each other, as you're noting. But in the past... Vote, uh, elections were more frequent for that reason. It was believed that state power was so abusive, you needed annual elections uh, to help provide some sort of veto on state power. And so in America in the 19th century, in the, eight, the late 18th century, annual elections, sometimes elections even every six months were more common. And you had very few governorships where it, they had a four-year term. That's a that's like a 20th century thing, too, where we decided governors need four-year terms. But right up until the 70s and 80s, tons of governors still had two-year terms. But what you hear now from people, these right-wing types, are like, oh, we don't, we don't want more elections. Uh, those are expensive. We should just give these, we should give, we should give politicians more years to do horrible things because, what, you want me to vote every year? Well, yeah, if you were John Adams, you thought annual elections were great and the only way to really control state power. Somehow we bought into this dumb idea that elections uh, necessarily give power to the regime and you shouldn't have them very often because if you have them annually, that somehow gives even more support to the regime. That would have been a totally bizarre point of view to the people who wrote the Bill of Rights, the Anti-Federalists, those sorts of guys. Right. I mean, if, if you look at you know, the idea that some 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 long-term time horizon from the legislature is going to produce good legislation, we'll just check out the seat of Senate. Um, you know, though, though as, as, as a Floridian, my, my sympathetics for sympathy for, for a longer governor's term might, might be a little different than most. But uh, but yeah, I mean, but, but like the, the only reason Marco Rubio might vote against like a red flag law is because he's got an election this year and so he's got to amplify turnout. And but I, I, I do think that this is one of those things that I, I think you, you even see see the problem with, I think, a lot of like idealistic libertarians in politics. Right. Is that they believe that politics is about, you know, putting forward this very, you know, this, this this grand platform, right? And if you just persuade people to embrace the the beauty and the logic of your platform, then that's going to mobilize the masses to 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 support your side, and we can make you know good changes and things like that. In politics, it's it's almost always people voting against someone, right? It, it's it's often a negative vote rather than a positive vote, and that's why like political revolutions and mass mo mass movements. You know, they are inspired by what should happen after the tyrant falls, right? They, they, they are sparked by a resistance to the tyrant. And, and, and this is why revolutions often create chaos, because like the ability to create a consensus of what should be after what is falls becomes a lot more difficult. And, and so like the idea that, that we're going to have some sort of great positive agenda push forward there, 
no, like it's there, there's a lot of disagreement on what should come next, but you can you know figure out pretty quickly whether the guys in power should should be taken out of office because you know your life is worse off, and and I, I think that that dynamic. I mean, you're definitely seeing it play out with with just enthusiasm within the political process in America right now, where like you you see the uh, the turnout rates of uh, Republicans in primaries versus Democrats in primaries. Like Democrats are very very low. Because, you know, even proud Joe Biden supporters in 2020 are not particularly enthused with his performance right now for for a variety of reasons. Um, Whereas, like, you have a lot of Republicans that, you know, are saying, let's go Brandon and, and, you know, buying little stickers to put on gas pumps. Right. And so so the energy is critiquing it and attacking what currently exists because they feel they, they, they blame Biden for his pain. A lot of it valid. Some of the Fed stuff, you know, beyond him. Um, But. I think that that aspect of politics, political activism as a, as a check against it is something that I, th- I think can, can often be overlooked. So we're, we're both localists, so we can agree as far as reforms go that who can vote and where and when should be at most at the state level, maybe even locally. I don't know. Send your delegates to the state house or to the Senate and House, whatever suits you, so that there's represent representation in those places in accordance with the way that the states and locals want to select them, right? I've, I'm, I'm against this whole idea that the Constitution tells you in what manner you can send representatives to Congress. Uh, it's There should really be, the Constitution should be silent on that beyond just the number uh, that are allotted to each place. Have elections whenever you want as a state. Uh, but outside of that, outside of keeping it local, what, what are the top two things uh, that you think should be reforms in terms of ballot collection, voting, voter fraud, all that sort of thing? Well, I I do think that there is value in, and again, like the, 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 ballot box bulk harvesting stuff like i i I think that very much is a situation where if if you recognize that again i i i think that that is a a valid concern about what happened in the 2020 election where you had these these last second changes again the the lack of of any sort of of you know really security apparatus i mean many of these places had no no cameras like i i think to the degree to which the electoral process is going to be used as a justification for the next president. You know, I, th- there needs to be a a, a, a ch- chain of custody baked in there that, that has some integrity to it. And then, of course, the 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 if you do not have that, the proper response should be discarding those ballots entirely, which is the sort of move that no judge in the country was willing to do because of the way that that would end up with with riots and things like that, which kind of, again, just goes to the political supercharged nature of this. Um, the other side of it is, is that um, I do think that one of the interesting aspects of this, you, you know, localized elections is that there, there is, I think the degree to which people can recognize that not relying upon some sort of expert or or to to control this sort of stuff um the degree to which there is recognition you know for example there in, in florida there's there's a defend florida pack or a, a defend florida group that is going through and themselves going out there and double checking on addresses and things like that on the voter roll side of it and the degree to which there's a recognition that if, if you really care about election integrity, then simply complaining about it and hoping, you know, the governor with a stroke with a pen is going to solve this problem. I think that feeds into, you know, great dependence of elected officials. Right. I, I think that itself is a, is, is a bad thing. The recognition that there are ways to which we can organize as communities to improve data sets like this, to, to engage with you know, the, the, the degree to which your supervisor of elections plays a great role in how the, the process of voting, the, the auditing systems involved, you know, the more that we get people to recognize that if, if we are going to have a, a participat- participatory electoral process, there, there, there's a role for community involvement as a whole rather than, again, you know, believing that, that politicians are going to solve things. I, I think that just general change in framework lends itself to creating a, a better sort of, you know, kind of citizen class, if you will, that, 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 that will 
under you know, that, that that makes a, a lot less dependent sort of society, and I think that as a whole kind of helps broaden, uh, 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 cultivates a society that, that can that can withstand some of the what, what the, the propaganda of what the state's trying to push. Right? If, if you're out there, you know, knocking door to door, and the regime's trying to tell you everything's fine, and you're seeing that it's not, I think that's that's a, that's a way that we can kind of create a a, a class of people to better appreciate and see through the lies of the state. And then I think this is a dynamic there where the more that you have social media, the more that you have of, of platforms that aren't deeply controlled. Like if, if, if it was simply the, um, the mainstream media that people were, were depending upon for understanding what happened in 2020 or any election at this point, you know, that lens would be very, very controlled. It's precisely the fact that there has been individual independent journalists, um, filmmakers, uh, activist types that ha that have taken it their own responsibility to go through and comb through some of this data and what's been on there. I, th I think just the more we reflex that muscle, whether it's an election, you know, the election issue, whether it is school boards, right? It, any of these sort of localized institutions, the more there's a participatory aspect rather than outsourcing it to whoever wins the ballot. I think that's just a a a a, a better habit. Um, for communities as a whole, um, that's that's so. So I, it's been very interesting to see that side of it as well. Uh, you know, being in Florida with a lot of people very motivated by this issue, I, I, it's been interesting seeing some of these groups kind of in, uh, interact with the political environment. All right, well, we'll go ahead and leave it at that then for this episode of Radio Rothbard. We will be back next week with another one. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>